local people call them Heth Hen. When I came down here, of course, they consolidated the Heath Hen Reservation into the state forest. That little shack I lived in, the first year I was there, the, every morning there'd be, oh, maybe four or five hens and one or two cocks right around the house feeding in the acorns and things. They were like a partridge, maybe that, that big. And the color of the female, unless you really knew birds, I don't think you'd tell them from a partridge. Because the male uh, had these two sacks under here, air sacks, and then he had two feathers that hung down. And then when he went into his mating dance, which he'd be pounding on the ground like this, these feathers would come up like this, and then he'd make his call to blow up these air sacks, which was sounding boards, actually. And uh, it sounded, well, booming is the way it's been described. It sounded like a... Uh, tugboat whistle, steam whistle, a low whistle. Because of the, these air sacs, they would send the sound much further. And his, his uh, wings, he'd kind of stiffen them out and drag the tips of them on the ground while he's doing this dance and, and uh, these things going up and the sacks and then the boom and it was quite a sight. Around the, this little house I lived in, they'd be out there feeding and all of a sudden the male hen would get starting in on his dance, you know, and I'd just look out the window and watch him. It was quite a thing. When I got here, I think the most I ever counted that uh, I was reasonably sure were different flocks was something like 30, 35 the first year. Then the next year it was down to oh, right around 20. And then the next year they weren't nearly as many. And of course it finally wound up to just the old boom and bend so-called up there where Roger Angley lives now. Jimmy Green used to live there then. And he'd come out there in the spring, this one male hen, and go through his calls and one thing and another, you know, trying to get a hen. But he was the last one, so he, I think he showed up there a couple of seasons and then that was the end of it. 1914, I think, they had one great big forest fire that covered all the plains and all around the edges and everything and right during the nesting season. And it burned up Alan Kennison. I know he tell me he was game warden back then. And he said you go through the, the chad scrub oak, you know, and run across these nests with, with either the eggs all cooked or the young chickens burned and even the, the hens themselves burned. They couldn't get away from the fire. They were protecting the nests. And he said there no doubt there were hundreds and hundreds of them. And that's probably what really started them downhill. Yeah, Alan Kennison, that uh, was the Heath End superintendent. Uh, he lived out there in that house where Corellis is. And of course he was there all the time I was on the forest. He had cages, you know, and they tried to breed the Heath End, but they wouldn't in captivity. They, just nothing could be accomplished that way, and so most of his work then was going around trapping these house cats that the people had let go, you know, going, gone wild, and shooting hawks, or uh, catching those on, on traps, which, which apparently was the wrong thing. It always seemed to me that the shooting the hawks was, was what got the last of them, because they had some kind of a disease like pneumonia and other diseases that go from bird to bird to bird. And of course, when there were any number of them around, why a weak bird would be flying all by himself, and that was the one that the hawks would get and eat. And was killing off the hawks, the weak ones would still be able to get back into the flock when they lighted and uh, spread the disease that way. But the, uh, the Audubon Society, they also had a man down here doing the same thing shooting the hawks and catching the cats. After it was all over, someone, they got thinking about it and said, well, maybe we shouldn't have <laughs> killed the hawks. <laughs> like a lot of that stuff after it's too late. And then there's no question where the flocks were practically down to zero that some of the gunners around, you know, they'd, they'd see a heath in, the shucks would know you're around, shoot them, take them home and eat them. And no doubt that happened some of the last end of it. But they were real common because they, way back in, I think it's in the middle 1700s, in one of the town meetings of the selectmen, why they voted that the keepers of the poor could not feed heath hen to their people who were taking care of more than three times a week. <laughs>
Who was the last person supposedly to see the last Ethan? Well, there was a guy, Dr. Gross, I think he was the bird man for the state then, and he's the one that came down and kept tabs on him for the state. In fact, they had a blind they put in up there in the field, Jimmy Green's field, and he'd get in there with his cameras, and they had it set up about where this last male hen would, would come out so he could be in there and watch him take pictures. And I don't know whether he was the last one to see him or whether Alan Kennison was the last one to, to see one around, or maybe the two of them together because, of course, they were great friends.